Okay, so we will do Elizabeth uh, today, but we'll prop, uh, we won't get the Spanish Armada till Tuesday because I just forgot. You have to get the counter reformation because you have to, have to really talk about how just upset the Catholics were and how much Philip would be involved. Philip II, Charles V's son, who would be the king of Spain, the mighty Habsburg Empire, which of course they would blow on walls and become impoverished and have a bunch of leaders would do jaws for a while. But with that, We'll get to more Marian cousins in just a second. I did assign up uh, 14 1, I think it is. And 13 1, I did not write that down. I should have. We'll go back to writing everything on the board in three weeks. When have we gone back three weeks or four weeks? We're going to be back in the building, people. Wait, and you're going to stop. 12 4 and 13 1. Wait, didn't we already reach? We've already done 13, haven't we? I think so. 14 1. Wait, you think they're going to stop doing PowerPoints when they're all in the back? What's that? You say you're going to stop doing PowerPoints when they're all in the back? I'll still do some PowerPoints, but, uh, but I'll do some more on the board, but also, um, we're just going to be classing once a lot of stuff I didn't have online. Whatever. Sorry about that. It's supposed to be uh, 12.4 and 14.1 to the Reformation and the beginnings of the religious wars. So please have 14.1 read by Monday. I've already signed 12.4, but we just didn't quite get to it in the test. And I really wanted to have the test on Thursday. And so that is the uh, Queen Elizabeth and a few other things. So it'll tie it in. Then we'll get to the 30 Years' War. And then Kind of a weird shift. Then to the scientific revolution. <laughs> so we're going to horrific war, then to revolution. It's more war. Uh, oh, yeah, we got to do the English Civil War, too. It's England. And then they fight all the time. Okay, so just a couple things. Remember, Catherine Parr was Henry. He was Henry VIII's last wife. And she was more like a caretaker, almost like a motherly figure to him, as he could hardly move and think quite ill. For some reason, on Wednesday, I kept saying he had seven wives. And he had six wives. I think what I had in my head is I had that picture of all the wives, and there were seven faces with him. And I just said, I did the quick count seven. I just kept going with it. And great story. Uh, I said not to show, there's a history of Britain, it's called. And there's a series on this called, with Henry VIII. Uh, they do a really good job in this documentary, and another one about Elizabeth. But then there's another one on the English Civil War. And I went through, and which one do I want to watch? And I think the English Civil War one's the best one. So we're going to watch one of them. We'll watch that one next week. It's, it's great. It's great as you can be about a horrific, bloody, awful Civil War. And so, Catherine the Park, Henry VIII did die. Yes, he is dead now. And this is a very creepy, weird drawing of Henry VIII. And uh, that guy at the bottom with his head bent. Yeah. Uh, it's supposed to be the Archduke of Canterbury. Here is very young Edward. Here is the death of Henry VIII. So eighth, Henry VIII died. And so Edward VI becomes king. And he is just a little boy. Edward VI. But the important thing about him is he was dominated by Protestants. Protestants dominated Henry VI. And so they were somewhat influenced by Luther, but the big thing that were Protestants is they were they wanted that church land. Let me make sure everything's recording. It's on the screen. Good. So Thomas Cranmer, who was the Archduke, that's the Archduke, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury, the one who got the dissolution of the marriage, he was able to push through the Book of the Common Prayer. And the Book of the Common Prayer laid out what every single church of England must do, thus creating the Church of England. This will soon be called Anglican. In the United States, the Church of England is called Episcopalian. So the Episcopalian Church, it, the, the Episcopalian Church, it has a lot of Catholic elements. If you go to Episcopalian service, and, and go to a Catholic service, they're very close to the same. So they're not quite Lutheran. 
But by becoming Protestant, it was anti-Catholic. So make sure you get that down, anti-Catholic. And by being anti-Catholic, this would also encourage people who were like anti-Catholic to go to um, to leave England, go to places like Geneva, meet Calvin, and then go back to England. So we're setting up a big shift where we get to the Puritans and Calvinism in England. But he was sickly the whole time. Edward was sick. He had tuberculosis. They called it the consumption then. And tuberculosis is a horrible disease. Your lungs just fill up with basically phlegm and you drown in your own fluids. It's awful. Thus, consumed. And uh, it is somewhat solved by, uh, by antibiotics, but let's hope for the best. That is a coin from his crown or his, uh, his reign. And so after he died, I don't know why I did this, for nine days, a Protestant cousin, just 16 years old, Lady Jane Grey, would become, they put her on the throne. They got a sickly Edward to write that Lady Jane Grey would be the queen. And she was there for nine days. And she was a distant cousin. An intrigue within the intrigue of, uh, uh, in, the, in the castle eventually would throw her out because so many people were upset that she was just a distant cousin and they saw another child of Henry would be better, Mary. So she was immediately nine days and she had no idea what was going on. She didn't even really know she was going to become queen. It's actually a, just a great tragedy. She had been isolated for most of her life by various Protestant uh, noblemen who were thinking about who just could install her as queen. She had no idea. Then she had no idea why she was arrested. And then she was put in the Tower of London for two years and held pretty brutally as prisoner, never really understanding because of her isolation. Wow, I, I was playing with this. She was on the Tower of London. And two years later, she'd be executed. And she would become a symbol down the road of the mistreatment of women at this era. You know, women were used just for the power of men, but she was executed because she was still technically a threat to the problem. Poor Lady Jane. Or Lady, um, Jane. She was a, just a sad story of this intrigue between the Protestants and Catholics. Or just basically way to look at it is, don't think about it religiously. Just different groups of, mo of noblemen trying to take power. And so who did they get instead of her? Mary. She was Catherine of Aragon's daughter. And remember, they had annulled that marriage, so she technically wasn't an heir. So whatever. She was the daughter of Henry VIII, and so she would become queen and know she would reign for three years. And almost all the paintings of her, she's pretty fierce looking. She's, she's pretty fierce. She was Catholic. And the ministers around her and the people that she had sheltered with and, and shockingly kind of uh, saved her life, because she very well, it's kind of shocking they didn't have her killed when Edward was king. They were all Catholics and saw this is our chance, not just to get rid of the Protestants, but to get rid of our enemies. Let's get our enemies. And that is why she is going to be dubbed Bloody Mary. 287 people, including Thomas Cramer, the person who did the common book of prayers and annulled her mother's marriage, would be burned at the stake. Thousands of others would be arrested. She wasn't burned. No, no. She burned them. I said she was, I'm sorry. And that's why she would get the nickname Bloody Mary. Now, there have been a lot of apologists that said she had very little to do with this, and that's partially true, except for one thing. She was queen, and she did approve of the cracking down on Protestants. So this is a way to get rid of enemies using religion as an excuse. We've had through this before how religion could be used for power. It could, also, it could be used to take control. It could be used as an excuse for wars. And the religious... Um, Organized religion has a complex history. Well, 
then to cement the relationship with Spain, who is becoming the leading Catholic power, she would marry Philip II of Spain. Philip II was Emperor Charles V's uh, son. But remember, say, aren't they related? Very much so. Mary's mother was Catherine. Catherine was Charles V's uncle, and therefore, Catherine was Philip II's great. Did I say uncle? Yeah. It's a weird family. You know, whatever. It's just a name. Should I backtrack? Catherine was Charles V's aunt, and therefore Philip II's great aunt. So they're first cousins. They're first cousins. And then, almost immediately, they only met a couple times. They met, came back, got married, were with each other a while, then Philip had to go back to Madrid, and Mary was in London. And Mary very much wanted to have an heir of Philip II to tie them together. And she felt something here and thought it was a baby. She thought it was clicking, the first time that a mother could feel, which up until relatively recently, that's when they decided when there was life there. It was cancer. She had uterine cancer. And she died very quickly after. So Mary died of that. Uh, Mary's life in so many ways for other people and her was a tragedy. No way around that. And so with that, oh no, who's next? There's only one more kid. Anne Boleyn had a daughter who somehow survived, who even though she was raised by Protestants, she was very good at ingratiating herself to her stepsister. Oh, yes. It was the Chiefs 1970 Super Bowl huddle. How is that? I'm sorry, everybody. Queen Elizabeth, who would reign from 1558 to 1603. She, it's an absolute miracle that she survived because she, for most of her life, was around Protestants and raised and educated by Protestants, very intelligent, and to marry a legitimate threat because they were half sisters. I mean, she was a legitimate threat. What the heck? That, uh, that's an ermine, obviously, that's a sign of nobility. And uh, she, uh, red, red hair, they, they were, were a, kind of a white, lead-based makeup. Don't think about it. I say, it looks like she looks like one of those lizards, you know, that jumps up with the main thing. Uh, yeah, that was that was a high style. There's a there's so many paintings of Elizabeth. It's kind of maybe I'll take a minute to uh, and just go through all the paintings of Elizabeth. And uh, but while this is going on, the Catholic Church is fighting back. The Counter Reformation is going on. And just a sec, everybody. The Counter Reformation was the Catholic Church trying to get back control. Yeah, I have a bunch of Elizabeth paintings I'll show you. I'll do it at the end of a ring. And this shows okay, we have the blue and purple areas are Calvinist, still Catholic areas dominant, Lutheran. Etc. And so they want to reestablish themselves. So it's a counter reformation. And what does that mean? Well, first off, one of the great, the two most important leaders of this counter reformation would be Charles II, I'm making their Spanish names now, Carlos, which I like, and Philippe, Philip II. They were the monarchs who saw themselves most as leaders of the counter reformation. So Charles V, would advocate his throne in 1555, Philip for the rest of the century. And the fight Philip would have for the Counter Reformation would rage in the Holy Roman Empire, in Italy, all across the Mediterranean. Did I say Mediterranean? The Mediterranean, but also it'd be personified by the conflict with Queen Elizabeth. Yes. So is this also Queen Elizabeth? Huh? So this is kind of like a subheading after Elizabeth. 
because it, it's hard to to describe how we were getting to the Spanish Armada, to explain why they wanted um, Philip was so desperate to take England, we have to go to the counter revolution. I didn't know where else to put it, so I put it here. And so with that, talk a little bit about this counter reformation. This was to sell the Catholic Church to people. Paul the Third, Pope Paul the Third, and also Paul the Fourth too, but Paul the Third, he wanted to enforce discipline. We're not going to back down from our existing beliefs. We are going to crack down. And by the way, it's good to write a few words. If you didn't write all of that, you might have to be kind of you're forget. If you didn't write that list, you even know what that means. Okay. So, keep existing dogma. Here's Paul the Third. By the way, that, I've shown you other Pope pictures. Don't they all look about like this? And they want to show the grandeur of the church. Look how spectacular we are. So they're going to fight back. And Philip II, Mary's husband and now widower, wants to fight back. And he also wants to marry Elizabeth. That's another story. And so in, while this is going on, in Edward's reign, Mary's reign, and Elizabeth's reign, the Council of Trent is going to meet three sessions of the Council of Trent. Of Trent. And this basically set up church dogma. Dogma are the beliefs of the church for 400 years. It wouldn't be until 1964 that the church would have another council to have this kind of magnitude. And it would be that much magnitude. And basically they said, you have good works and faith. I don't care what Luther says. You gotta have good works, meaning you gotta follow the sacraments. And they also set the index of forbidden books. Books as they saw were going against the belief of the church and were uh, and committed heresy. And so this list of forbidden books would go on for over 400 years. And some of the most important works of that time would be forbidden, or for all time, would be forbidden because they might undermine the authority of the church. Here is a painting of the Council of Trent. And it's it's by Rubens. You see, they're all here. And then they kind of, I'm not sure what, but. So with that, we'll get to next week we're going to talk about Galileo. And he'll be on the index of forbidden books. You probably heard of Galileo. Yeah. He would be under house arrest. He, they, I'm surprised they didn't burn him at the stake. So. An example of this were under uh, a group, a society of faith called the Jesuits, Society of Jesuits. And their, uh, their leader was Ignatius Loyola. And that's why you hear of these Loyola schools and uh, Catholic schools called that. They're named after him. These would be these areas of high learning to teach monks to go educate the population, not just to show the great education they have, but to educate about the church. And they would be holy warriors against the Protestants and then spread the faith, evangelical, to go amongst the pagans. And so they would take advantage of places, let's say, New Spain, and spread throughout there, creating missions to spread the faith. And so here is Pope Paul IV, uh, meeting in nature's Loyola right here. And here is a very stylized picture of the way the Jesuits looked at themselves of going out amongst the people to fight Protestants and bring Catholicism. By the way, what's a pagan? To the definition of the Catholic Church, and therefore the Church, it's someone who's not Christian. That's a pagan. And so with that, should I raise the bomb or should we leave the bomb up? I like the bomb. bomb. And that's supposed to be a light, a light bulb. Oh, I thought it was a light bulb. <laughs> okay. I don't like to brag about my artistic skills, but it's very impressionist. You'll find out what the impressionists are. So with that, so that's where you get all these new world missions. When the Spanish would go, they would create these massive missions. And the reason I put this up here, because that's such a connection with the American Southwest. Look at all the Spanish missions, almost all created by the Jesuits to go and try to convert the people living here. 
So that's where you get, whether it be Santa Barbara, San Fernando, which is eventually uh, Los Angeles, San Diego de Alcaya. Uh, one of my favorite would be right up here at, uh, at Solano would become, uh, my goodness, my mind grows. Well, California's uh, made a safe. Okay, I'm getting old. North of San Francisco. It'll come to me in a second. No. I've been there three times. Someday you too will be old. It's going to pop in my head and I'll say it. It'll be like six o'clock tonight. So, they also would take over the Inquisition. And the Inquisition at first were this, map, this desire to, yes. It was still the yeah, they would take over the Inquisition. And there, there already was an Inquisition that was rooting out, it was really in Spain to root out Moors and Jews. Well, the new Inquisition to, to, was to root out Moors and Jews who supposedly converted, and let's see if they really did. And so they would put it under intense torture. And so here, they're torturing and forcing water down the throat. The water torture has been used for years. Uh, Israel will call it waterboarding. So they wouldn't act like they're torturing people. And that's what people call it today. And uh, they would also sometimes dump hot oil down the throat, fillet them alive. All those things they did to the Anabaptists were used by the Inquisition. But... This was not all. The Inquisition, by rooting out Jews, would send Jews, eventually would create what's called ghettos, where Jews would be combined to be spots of the city. For example, this would be the ghetto in Rome, because it happened first, areas where Jews would be forced to live. And sometimes they'd be walled off within, this is in Rome. In fact, this is uh, the St. Peter's is right about there on the map. And soon they, the ghettos, um, the Jews would be kind of forced out of Spain. Eventually, the majority of Jews in Europe would be living right here. In fact, the majority of Jews in the world. And they would live in areas isolated, of all kinds of restrictions and forced in to these areas, partially because anger over banking. But then what Pope Paul IV said was Jews were responsible for, kill, for the crucifixion of Jesus, and therefore they deserve to be persecuted, which... Um, is an age-old prejudice. And soon it would spread throughout Europe, these ghettos. And so there were still ghettos, and this area right here would be part of Imperial Russia, and we'll come back to these ghettos because that would be called the Pale. Have you ever heard the term beyond the Pale? That's partially where it comes from. They're in Ireland. That's another story. So not only that, the last thing about the, the Counter-Reformation, when we get back to Britain, was here we're going to show how wonderful the church is by a new style of art called Baroque. And they would overwhelm people. They would walk into these cathedrals or these buildings and just be like, wow, look at the church. Gold, gilt, massive structures. So this is one of my favorite, and you cannot get over how tall this altar covering is at St. Paul or St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. The biggest cathedral in the world. You walk in here, and there's this massive building up here. And you get closer and closer, and you realize that it's just, it just goes up forever. It's 70 feet tall. It's seven stories. Here's the amazing thing when you go to St. Peter's. So when you climb up, and you can climb up to the top of the Duomo, go to the very top. And uh, to give you an idea how big St. Peter's Cathedral is, you see this way up here? You just barely make out this rail. You can walk up there, which is a little bit weird because you're you're way up there, and this looks tiny. Oh wow! It's amazing. If you're scared of heights, so which one was the one where you said you don't want to climb the dome, you want to go into the tower? That's Florence, and it's a little bit shorter. That's okay. the Duomo there. But they don't have anything like that there, so you climb the tower. You got an amazing view, but it's <laughs> it's a little bit scary, and that's a picture I took, that's from the cathedral looking out over the colonnade and the great cathedral here. The Jewish quarter was right about here. And look at how spectacular this is. 
Look how great the church is. That's all the Vatican City. So the board of the Vatican City is right here. Huh? Yeah. This is taken from St. Peter's, the Duomo on top. So up about, uh, what do you have? That would be about 40 stories up. I, I didn't like it. I, I did it. That was another one. I'm, I get I have a little bit of vertigo and I, I get this like stump and I did it. I'm so glad I did it. I don't know if I can do it again. Oh, they have a model of the Washington Monument. Huh? They have a model of the Washington Monument. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. So what happened was uh, it became a big deal at going into the 19th century. Uh, when uh, Napoleon took Egypt for a couple of years, they brought back all these obelisks. Remember, we showed you those? Mm -hmm. They brought it back, and it became a big deal that the church got back. Mm -hmm. And so, this is from Egypt. Oh, really? Yeah. And there's a, there's a huge one in, in Paris, right, right near the Louvre. It's really cool. Oh, yeah. But obviously, stolen from Egypt, too. And this would become the rage, and it's no coincidence then in the 1820s, they built uh, one of these obelisks for the Battle of Bunker Hill as a monument. And it was so popular, they copied the Washington Monument. So they actually, they do relate. It's just the other way around. So, oh, this is the old fortification. Rome is cool. Oh, and it was right about here. Let's see, we crossed that bridge. No, we crossed this bridge. And right about here, we went to this restaurant where these little old ladies were. And we ordered food. And they just, they loved me. They just loved me. I can't even make, I mean, they all came out, the, the woman, these little old, these old grandmas. That's all I could think of them. They came out, oh, they, they just thought I was the greatest thing ever, which was, it was, my wife just laughed so hard. And so we ordered something, and they just said, no, no, no. And they brought me something special. And it came out this mound of food. There's a noodles and something homemade. And mad cow disease was going through Europe when we were there, so we weren't eating beef. You kind of you have to eat a lot of meat. You have kind of, you not, don't eat meat at that time it was hard. Now it's easier. But it was beef because it was special for me. And men eat beef. And it was a mound of noodles. This is amazing. And there's like a plate this big like that for me. And they all came out and they like this and then they brought out like these cookies and stuff. Well, my, my wife and I are like talking, well, if we ever you know, save up money again, go back to Rome. That's where my nephew lives, about 50 miles from there, another nephew. Um, I don't know if we want to go back because you can never go back to a great experience and try to relive it because it's never as good. It's never as good. That was one of my favorite moments in my life. So, and then the next day, the town shut down because Rome, oh, that was that night, the town shut down because this, this, uh, the soccer team won the, the Italian championship, oh, yeah. and it's just crazy. That was, that was a great trip. That was when we're back home. So here's a couple of examples from Vienna. The Schoenberg Palace. This is in front of the Habsburg Monarchy. But look at the massive ornate, the beautiful dome, the ornate tower, or the ornate colonnade, a little bit of classical there. Look at the statues. Look how wonderful the church is. And then let me show you two artists. Caravaggio is an incredible artist. I gotta shut the lights off. He has this, it, if you look at it, it doesn't look like mannerism. You remember Michelangelo and how they drew? But they exaggerated the features. Exaggerate this is called the Seven Works of Mercy. So it's a biblical slash not story is one of those, but these dramatic art showing Renaissance style, but they would put these huge personal sagas and look at the, you know, the facial expressions and it's just amazing pictures. And then I put this one because I've always liked the blue flag. Exaggerating her, the way that it looks. Um, I just like that painting. So it's not quite as dramatic, but since I like the loop player, you have to look at that. This one's in, that was, I think that was in the Uffizi Museum in Florence. And then the probably the most famous was John, oh, Peter Paul Rubens. And there is the massacre of the innocents. And look at the same deal. Look at the dramatic picture of, uh, this is a massacre, this is during, um, um, the Greek invasion of Rome back at uh, 200 BC. 
Judd Butler and with the Pyrrhic victory, with the massacre of uh, Romans, and look at the, the way the bodies are shaped, how dramatic they are. Rubens is great. Lots of chubby flying angels. But another painting I really like is the hippopotamus and crocodile hunt. Crocodile, crocodile hunt. And this, I mean, just look how dramatic. And that's one of those you want to look at, and you can't help it. You can see it lots of, wow, this church is great. I'm enjoying it. This is what we call advertising. So I just want to mention Ruben or Capobaggio. You see them in the same areas, but you go through a museum where they have it chronologically. You go through the Renaissance, and then you get to Rubens and the Baroque art. So with that, where we at here? So you just have to know, just the Rubens and Caravaggio, you just need to know the names. You don't need to know the, well, you can write them down if you want to know their art. I, I really like this. But here's the area of Catholic. There's another map. I just want to put this in here to show you how the green is Islam, and it is spreading into this area here. And look at the massive Eastern Orthodox. Yeah. What's the little spurt of green in Russia? Oh, those are for the... Uh, they're, they're Turkish warriors. Uh, I mean, no, this goes back during the Mongol invasion and then the, when they were pushed out by the Turks, they converted and went into this area. Oh. And so there was a big body of, of, of um, Muslims right here. And there's going to be a bunch of German Christians right there. Yes? Oh, what's the Those are the, um, they're Buddhists. And so there are Buddhists who live there. Yeah. And in Eastern Orthodox was when Constantinople split with that whole that schism, yeah. Uh huh. Are they still on this map? No, they're not showing this map because they were never the majority population. But it was a huge minority and it was right in here. And so and it would get bigger and bigger, and soon this would be the biggest Jewish population in the world. Is it still? No. Where is it? Uh, the biggest population of Jews in the world. There's still a huge population in Russia, but of Jews, of Jews, it's either still in Russia, but it's Israel and the United States. Okay. And what happened was in 1939, Nazi Germany took Poland. And as a measure of total war, that's when the Holocaust began. So most of those who survived, they decided not to blame them, get the hell out of Europe. And so back to Queen Elizabeth. So we set up all that we got this counter rebel uh, and this conflict happening. You see why I did that? I had to kind of get back and say, wow, the Catholic Church is fighting back. Just at a time now we have a Protestant monarch in England. And I, this is my favorite picture of her with the scepter and orb. And this, I mean, that was the height of beauty. It just looks so, I don't, yes. I mean, women have always had to dress more uncomfortably than men. But then, wow. And also, she's clearly wearing a, cor uh, a whalebone corset that is just crushing her. A, a, a girl, I mean, they are squeezing that thing tight because... The fashion was to be, um, to not be thin on top of your legs, but be really thin in your waist. So have those curves. Yeah. I was sort of in one of those for two years. Sort of scoliosis. Oh, yeah. Back three. And um, I had a lot of scoliosis. Yeah. Sure. Also, in part due to the fact that um, I physically could not breathe properly for three years when I was on my feet. Yeah, that makes sense. If it's here, it crushes your diaphragm. You can't breathe. It, it was like all the way up, like it was a full body break. Ooh. And rub, every time you take a step and rub it a little bit, it would wrap. Right. Oh, sorry, I'm wrong. Huh. But now, no, you know. Oh, when, no. when did you get out of it? What? How old were you when you? You're half a robot. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I've been a robot since I've Yeah. 
Remember us when the robots take over, all right? So here is Philip again. So back to Philip. Philip was this queen, the king of Spain. That was his monarch, or that was his reign. And he married Mary, and he tried to marry Elizabeth. But Elizabeth would not marry him. She was advised not to, because if she married Philip, Catholics would take over. The Catholic nobles would win. The Catholic nobles would win. So she was advised to not marry. And to give you an idea of the power Philip had by then, look how big his empire was. So all this area in green, that's Philip. This massive empire. New Spain was huge. That's when Patatsu was bringing all that silver. They had appeared like they had a lot of wealth. And as he saw it, it is my job to root out the Protestants. So at that, he, while this is going on, would be involved in a number of crusades against those fighting the church. In fact, he would create a short-term holy league to root out the Mediterranean. And I didn't type this in. Who's Philip's enemy in the Mediterranean? What empire? What? Who? The Ottoman Empire. Who, at that moment, were threatening Vienna? Who then was where the capital of his uncle, Ferdinand? Charles V let him be the uncle. This Holy League, and they have to fight. So Philip wants to marry Elizabeth to get them involved in the Holy League. Elizabeth knows if I marry Philip, not only will the Protestants take over, but what becomes of Elizabeth? If she marries Philip, what's Elizabeth become? A wife. Yeah, a wife. She doesn't want that. That's part of the reason why she would never get married, and she would make it very clear that she would be the virgin queen married to England. Does that make sense? I'm chased like a... I'm chased like a priest. And I'm married to England. That is why the state of Virginia is called it, because it's named after the Virgin Queen. And I should add, was she a virgin or not? First off, not it doesn't matter. But secondly, well, no. But all this is is image. It's image. Well, the Holy League would fight the Ottomans in one of the greatest naval battles in history, the Battle of Lepanto. 1570, off the coast of Greece, now modern Greece, the Spanish captain was a guy named Don Juan, and using their galleys, but also new sailing vessels and cannon, they were able to defeat a larger Ottoman fleet. And this ended much of Ottoman expansion. Ottomans are still going to be a mighty empire. They're going to besiege Vienna 100 years after this. But this somewhat stopped the expansion of the Ottoman Empire. There's a couple of battles, Siege of Rome and Malta, but Lepanto. Uh, I just read, a, uh, this summer, I read a very good book about this fight, Philip and his crusade. It was, wow, what a story. But they, the Mediterranean, the Lepanto's right there. Okay, so finish up Elizabeth tomorrow. We kind of set the stage because all this stuff is happening. So the Counter-Reformation, Philip, so Monday, Tuesday, will be uh, the Armada. Everybody at home, don't forget, Monday's off, so A-Day is, A-Day will be on Tuesday, Wednesday, B-Day, Thursday, Friday, and then in three weeks, we're back four days a week, and look at there's going to be block schedules. My guess is what's going to happen is they'll do... First through third, and then fourth through seventh. Zero pair would just be zero pair. I think. Sure. We, well, um, we talked about it at lunch a little bit in student council, and I think the one that so if they decide to do block schedule, it'll be 
closer to the long along the lines of zero through third on Monday and Tuesday, and then four through seven on Thursday and Friday. They talk about that, and that's what everyone that's what everyone's going through, but they're gonna come up with a problem with that. Not everyone has zero period. And this, yeah, so we got zero period teachers. See, the reason why they did is, and I know what you said, and that's what I've heard too. They might still try to do it. But they kind of block scheduling like a few years ago when they had a, a full-day release, and they ran into that problem with zero curve. And so they, they, couldn't, they couldn't solve it then. I don't know what they're going to do. I mean, personally, what I'd love is just eight periods. <laughs> just not doing anything. The, but you know the reason why they're thinking if we limit the number of times they're in the hallway. I mean, who knows? The number of cases are dropping down. The wild version of coronavirus is definitely not as dangerous. But the mutants are really dangerous. And we'll see what happens. And whatever happens, I'm blaming you. Okay. I'll, I'll take that personally. Have a good weekend, Mr. Park. You too. <laughs> Elijah, did not get a chance to break your test. I know. So I just gave you a zero. I didn't give you mine. Where's the key?